This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Jax. Jax is the user-friendly wallet that works across all your devices and handles both Bitcoin and Ether. Go to jax.io and embrace the future of cryptocurrency wallets. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. So today we have a really awesome episode for all of you. We are going to talk about Truebit, which is one of the one of the truly visionary projects that I I see in the in the ecosystem. So Truebit is a project that somehow scales the amount of computation we can do using smart contracts. And we are going to talk to the people who wrote the white paper for Truebit. They are Jason Teutsch and Christian Reitwiesner. So many of you would know uh, Christian from from his role at the Ethereum Foundation where he leads the development of Solidity, Remix, and the form, and their formal verification effort. Uh, Jason, um, Jason it, it has had like postdoc positions at multiple universities, including NUS in Singapore. And uh, we're going to interview the two of them today on their efforts at Truebit. So before we start, let's have a brief background about uh, both Christian and Jason, starting with Jason. Jason, tell us how you got into the blockchain space in the first place. I think my blockchain story starts back in 2014 when Pratik Saxena, who is a computer science professor at the National University of Singapore, invited me to uh, work on a research project with him. And uh, I read my first uh, research paper about Bitcoin as I was on my on that plane over to Singapore. He had given me um, a paper that he wrote called uh, Power Splitting Games, which is about, uh, it was a block withholding attack that, that sort of hurts uh, Bitcoin mining pools. And um, I thought it had some interesting game theory in it, so I was, I was sort of uh, excited about that. And uh, so, 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 I mean, of course, Pratik, before he came, he sort of mentioned the project that, that we were going to be, um, he had mentioned a project about sort of verifiable computing. So it's sort of, you know, this is, um, you know, people send tasks out to, to cloud. So there's this sort of cloud computing going on these days where you send, you ask Amazon to perform a task for you and Amazon comes back and says, the answer is uh, 47. Well, how do you know the answer is 47? Aside from just saying, well, I, I trust Amazon. I mean, can, can we do better than that? So, you know, I started when I came into Singapore. We were looking at sort of, uh, you know, what, what sort of problems are easy to verify. Maybe they're hard to, to compute, but they're, they're easy to verify. And, you know, one day I'm sitting in, in Pratik's office, and a graduate student walks in, and uh, Loy Lu, who, he walked into the office and said, you know, hey, hey guys, there's, a, there's uh, a new cryptocurrency. It's got a turn complete scripting language. Um, you know, it's called Ethereum. There's, it doesn't exist yet, but there's a guy, uh, you know, Vitalik Buterin, who's, who's going to make it happen. And, you know, it, it didn't take long for us to sort of uh, see verifiable computing meet, meet blockchain. Uh, and that, that was really the birth of the consensus computer. You know, what is the consensus computer? It's is basically a way of, of making Ethereum smart contracts to, to compute um, certain tasks correctly, specifically those which don't require much verification. So you turn Ethereum into, into a sort of uh, computer. So we wrote the first academic paper about Ethereum, and that was, you know, Two months after I had, you know, read my first, uh, well, really found out. Two months after I had known what a Bitcoin was, so I was really a, a newbie here. We we sent the paper to to CCS, which is you know one of the major security conferences in the United States, and they they rejected our paper. Uh, you know, they said 
you know, this, this, this attack in your paper, it's, it's, it's never going to happen. You know, it's, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's a bunch of theory. And, but of course, uh, then during the rebuttal period, the attack it did happen um, on the Bitcoin network. So that, that was the July 4th fork. If you remember July 4th, 2015, there was a fork on the Bitcoin network, which was six blocks long. And the next day, July 5th, there was another one that was three blocks long. So our, our paper sort of predicted that, uh, that failure on the network. And well, they changed their mind. Our, uh, our paper got accepted to, to CCS. And um, what can I say? We got lucky. So, so, so that was actually, that was the beginning of TrueBit, although none of us really knew it at the time. So that's, that's, that's kind of how it all started. And Christian, uh, so you've been involved with Ethereum for, for quite some time too. Tell us about uh, your background and how you got to be involved uh, with Ethereum and you know, leading up to this current important time uh, working on TrueBit. So, uh, yeah, actually I don't remember when I, heard, when I first heard about Bitcoin and blockchains, but uh, it was, I was observing Bitcoin and, but never was really a part of it. And I always felt I was missing out on something. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, I was also always interested in, in this uh, peer-to-peer -to -peer stuff and uh, decentralization and, uh, yeah, taking away the power from centralized entities and so on. And then, uh, yeah, I have a, a background in, in computation complexity. So, yeah, the, the theory that talks about uh, computation and resources needed for that. And so, yeah, during the, the, the pre-sale for Ethereum, I heard about Ethereum for the first time. And uh, yeah, I immediately felt, yeah, that's it. I have to, I have to, I have to do that. And so I joined in, in October 2014 um, and uh, yeah, started working on Solidity. Um, yeah, and I think, so how did I get to TrueBit? At some point, I think it was the discussion about the, uh, um, yeah, I think we'll get to into that later, uh, about the Dogecoin uh, bridge and how you can verify the Dogecoin proof of work on Ethereum. And I think it was a discussion with, with Vitalik and we came up with the, this general idea, I think. And um, I think at some later point, uh, Jason Vitalik met you at a conference and he told you about that, right? And then that's how the, we, we got the connection. Yeah, uh, Vitalik right. said, oh yeah, there's this guy at this conference. He's, he's, he has exactly the same idea. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <brilliant. laughs> we were, um, right. So I guess Vitalik put, 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 put us, uh, introduced us together and that the rest was uh, sort of history. But. I wanted to, to mention, you know, in terms of my background, you know, I'm, I'm a mathematician and, and, you know, I think one of the things that was, that was so, you know, really, really struck me, you know, and was a game changer when I, about the, the CCS paper, you know, I never in my life had a, had a time when, you know, a current event, like, sort of directly impacted the research that I was doing. I mean, it's just sort of unthinkable in, in mathematics, you know. We don't wake up in the morning and say, you know, is the Pythagorean theorem going to be true today? I mean, does it depend on, you know, uh, anyway, I can come up with any number of examples. So for me, that was like kind of like a, a real eye opener. And it, 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 it's sort of, uh, you know, and now, you know, being on, in, in TrueBit, you know, I, I can't even imagine being, uh, you know, in a, you know, in, interviewed for, for, for the work that we're doing and stuff like this. It's, it's tremendously exciting to see that you know, mathematics can have uh, you know, an impact in the, in the real world and especially you know, game theory and... I, I could totally understand that. Like here's, at, at some level, it sometimes feels like, like here's most of us, you know, just, a, just a bunch of nerds you know, thinking about like money, gold, nature of money, nature of computation, in your case, mathematics, and suddenly, with this technology, it's like, you know, all of our thoughts suddenly start to have real monetary impact, you know, like, uh, like we would, we would do, we would do things like this just as a hobby, but now it turns out like our hobbies are worth, you know, like in aggregate, like billions of dollars. 
and you know like with us episodes we make can influence the markets right like uh, like like recently we did an episode on ripple xrp and lo and behold like two days later everything else is down but ripple xrp is like up 25 percent and we were like what happened to ripple xrp at that time and and it's almost as if like you know like things you do uh end up c connecting to the real world in this technology in a, in a strange way so i think it's it's it must be similar for you on the on the mathematics side of it so um christian um Tell us like about your journey in Ethereum, like when you started working with Ethereum, did you ever think it would be so big? Uh, did have recent events caught you by surprise or did you expect it to be so influential? I mean, it was a, a, a gradual thing, right? So we always thought, I mean, the, the, the potential of this is huge. And we thought about, oh, I'm, yeah, this might be used in the real world somewhere. And we wrote the code and we had the, some of the early ideas and so on. But yeah, I mean, it's still not mainstream, so it doesn't feel like, uh, I don't know, my parents uh, using it. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely, uh, yeah, grew quite big, right? So moving on to the, the topic that we're here to discuss a true bit, I have to say I've, I've, uh, I've dabbled at the white paper it's a very interesting concept uh, on the face of it. Now, I'm, I'm hoping that you guys can shed some light on how it works and what the use cases are. Uh, and uh, so explain to us at the, at the core, you know, what Truebit is trying to solve as a problem. And, uh, and then after we can go into how it's doing that. Maybe we just start with what the problem is first. I think in order to, to, to say what problem we're solving, we need to sort of explain where we are right now. Sure. So, smart contracts that are in Ethereum, so I'm gonna sort of assume that people are familiar with what smart contracts are. They're, they're basically programs that live on the blockchain. They're uncensorable, they're unstoppable. They do whatever they're programmed to do when they're first issued. So, um, but they have very limited computational capacity. I mean, they, they can't, you can't do anything more than very trivial tasks with a, uh, with a smart contract. Um, and you know there, you know, there's a gas limit in Ethereum. You know, so so that that sort of gives a bound on the amount of computation you could do. So so you know, it, Truebit is is a solution which basically makes makes allows smart contracts to do you know real computation like you'd expect on your 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 you know your home computer for example. But uh, you know, but let's get the elephant out of the room. You know, you know why not just wipe out the gas limit, you know, that's, that, that's the obvious thing, you know, then, then everyone can just compute whatever they want, but the, the, it's just simply not secure. So for one thing, you know, folklore say, you know, why can't smart contracts do, do more computation? You know, a lot of people say, well, it's because everyone on the network has to duplicate everything. It's just too expensive, you know, but that doesn't, you know, you, that, that's, that's very superficial level. I mean, you could always pay people more uh, I think so. If you if you scratch a little bit deeper, the real reason you can't do uh, substantial computations over the Ethereum network is that you're basically asking the miners to do these computations for free. Now everyone knows about transaction fees, but those only go to the miner that finds the block. But every miner has to now check these blocks. Uh, you know, after they 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 have to check it for free, so they know which which is the longest valid. Chain and you're you're asking them to do it for free. Remarkable that any, that they're willing to do anything for free. I mean that, but they're willing to do a little bit for free. This is the sort of the amazing piece of Bitcoin and, and Ethereum that, that that makes it work. And if you go back to the uh, you know idea of the consensus computer, yeah, you can compute things that are, are trivial. But what's 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 you know we we had a, a piece there called the, what we called the verifier's dilemma. And, and what does that mean? So basically, you said, suppose a, suppose a task came in that was actually difficult to verify. It took a miner a long time. So now there's this sort of incentive for a miner to skip the verification, right? So, so he, could, he, could, he could skip the verification. Well, that's bad, because then you could get wrong things on the blockchain. But it's even worse than that, because even though the miner can skip, skip ver verification, if, if everyone else is also verifying, he may end up mine, by skipping, you know, mining on, on the wrong block. So, so then uh, 
he doesn't, a, a rational miner doesn't even know whether to verify or not, right? I mean, because, you know, if he wants, to, if, if everyone else is verifying, he better verify too. And if everyone else is skipping, then he has to skip. But, you know, there's, for a very high computation, it's impossible to know what, you know, miner wants to be on the longest chain because that's sort of the convention. But uh, that's, that's what the verifier's dilemma is about. Don't know whether to verify or not. So it's, you can get all sorts of garbage onto the blockchain if you, if you, just ignore the gas limit in Ethereum. And not only that, but you could have denial of service attacks too because people just throw stuff out there to waste miners' time and, and uh, they have finite resources. So. If I could rephrase that, let, let, let me see if, 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 if I'm getting it correct. So what you're essentially saying is that, so in Ethereum, we have this analogy of the world computer, right? That um, a, a computer is basically a machine that executes is able to execute some some form of instructions and in in history like we have implemented computers as these mainframes inside universities as desktops as laptops as mobiles and like vitalik's sort of idea was that you could imagine a whole blockchain network as this as this computer that can also execute these instructions it can like you can store data there and uh, you can you can basically do any kinds of computations on a blockchain network and these computations are called smart contracts and you can obviously also put data in these smart contracts now if you think of start thinking of it as a computer it can only do very limited amounts of computation so i think somebody compared it to being like a smartphone right like it can it can do a very little amount of computation what you're saying is like what truebit is trying to do is kind of scale it from just being just having the capability of computing equal to let's say a smartphone to something maybe you know thousands or a million millions of times greater right and the other piece you're saying is that what is the ultimate reason why ethereum the system is only able to do um, such less computation there you're saying that the reason for that is something called the verifiers dilemma which is that if the four of us are miners in Ethereum, like spread around the world, and let's say there's a, one of us discovers the next block, so Jason discovers the next block, then Jason is paid for that block to include transactions and computations inside the block. But then there is no incentive for Christian, Sebastian, and Meher to verify that what Jason claims as the results of these computations are actually correct. Is that, is that right? Right, they don't get paid for it. So there is, I mean, there's an incentive in the sense that if they don't verify, they might end up mining on the wrong chain and they won't get rewards, but they don't, they don't receive a payment for the verification per se. Yeah, for Ethereum, it's also a, a bit different because so at the point where you stop verifying, you're also unable to include new transactions yourself because uh, in Ethereum, you have, you have state and you need to update that. And uh, if you only have the, the Merkle root of the state, you can't really update the state. So uh, if you stop verifying as a miner, you can't get uh, uh, yeah, fees from, from including transactions. But yeah, you can mine empty blocks. So that's, that's still, still an option for you. So, so tell us what is the core concept behind, behind Truebit? How, how are you, what are you doing and how, how do you intend to do it? So we have, we have basically two assumptions. On, on Truebit. One is that the consensus computer works. In other words, smart contracts can do trivial computations correctly. And this is just an empirical observation. We've, you know, we, we, we see Ethereum doing what it's supposed to do and you know, that's why people use it. The other thing is that we assume that people, uh, you know, participants are, are, are rational. And by rational means they're working individually to maximize their own personal profit in, in collecting Ethereum tokens or, or whatever Bitcoin um, happens to be. Well, I guess we're really talking about Ethereum here, so let's just focus on that. Uh, so, so, of course, the assumption of rationality is, is somewhat idiosyncratic. It's also somewhat pessimistic because Satoshi Nakamoto said that, you know, the majority of miners are just going to be honest. And while that may have been true in the very beginning when people when Bitcoin was getting started and it was about the politics and the people really didn't trust the government and that's that's why they were there playing Bitcoin. But since then, you know, you, we've seen, uh, you know, 
people switching from CPU hardware to ASIC miners so they can get more coins. So also, um, well, I guess we can't judge people's intentions, but people are switching switching hardware. We see we also see that uh, you know people, um, miners joining mining pools and in effect changing the software. So my feeling is people are you know, miners are actually in the network. They want to make money. I mean that's sort of the assumption of of Truebit. So. So how can we, given that most people are, are rational, you know, how can we sort of take advantage of this sort of natural inclination that, 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 that people seem to have? Um, so, so those are the core, core two pieces. And we, we will, will, will assume that you know, we have this small thing that, that works correctly, and we want to blow it up. So, so, so we do this in, in, in two pieces. So, so first of all, how can you get a tiny computer, like a consensus computer, to even check a really hard computation. So, so we designed this game, which we call the verification game, which uh, Christian alluded to earlier. That was what uh, Vitalik heard about the verification game from me, and he heard about it from Christian. And for those of you who were around back in uh, you know, 2011, you might have heard it from Kennedy, Riva, and Rothblum, who, who published uh, a paper with almost exactly the same idea. Of course, they didn't have cryptocurrency in mind, so it was, you know, really about um, a situation of cloud, cloud computing back then. But so, so what we do is you 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 imagine that there's the consensus computer sort of acts as a judge. You have one solver who says here's the solution, and a verifier who says no, it's not. So. The consensus computer just has to adjudicate and decide who's right. Well, it, it, it creates a game in such that the judge only has to enforce the rules of the game, but doesn't actually have to do the computation itself. So in each round of the game, you reduce the sort of possible places where the error could occur. So it's, the judge has to pinpoint the error, and eventually the, it becomes so, you know, such a, a small piece that he can actually look at it and, and uh, determine who was right, whether the challenge was very justified. So I'm, I'm trying to understand what, what a use case of this might be and, and, and tell me if this is, makes any sense or not. I want to use a world computer, right? A, a distributed computer to do something like compile software. Like I want to compile the Ethereum Go client. Is this something I could do using Truebit? And if, if so, then how would I do that? And if not, where am I getting this wrong? <laughs> so that, that's, that's a very interesting use case. And let me modify it a bit. So uh, can I use Truebit to uh, verify inside a smart contract that a certain piece of Solidity source code was compiled with a certain compiler into a certain piece of uh, EVM bytecode? And uh, that's uh, definitely something that can be done with Truebit. And yes, it's one of the use cases. Okay, because earlier we were talking about sort of this idea that you could, I don't know if this was pre-show or what, but you know, we were talking about this idea that you know, the, the model right now is you have, say, AWS, and, and, and you ask AWS to do some kind of computation. That could be calculating some really complex formula or uh, doing some encryption or maybe decryption or maybe compiling software or you know, encoding video. Uh, and and that it, as, as far as I understand it, Truebit is a way to do this in a distributed way so that you don't have to trust Amazon uh, or you don't have to trust a central a entity. And Ethereum does that, but it does that in a way that only is available for smaller computations and not large computations. So if, if this is the, the, the premise, then how does that port over then to Truebit? Or am I getting the premise wrong? I guess one, one thing I'd sort of maybe like to, to clear up is that, as you pointed out, Truebit is, is a, a completely democratic system. There's no, there's no reputation. There are no upper class nodes. There's no, you know, uh, Federation or anything like that. It's, it's, in that sense, it's, it resembles uh, Bitcoin and the way Ethereum originally was and the way Ethereum is, is right now. And, and in fact, when there, an error occurs, it's also a different kind of consensus. We're, it's not a majority consensus. We're talking about a unanimous consensus. 
right? So anyone on the network can, can, can uh, challenge a solution before it hits the blockchain. Anyone can do it. And you know, then they will play this verification game. I guess the real trick, if, if you want to say, to, to getting TrueBit to work is, you know, how do you convince people to actually play the verification game? I mean, normally, if everyone knows that all the answers are going to be right, then who's going to be around to check the answers, right? I mean, the, you, if, if, if you get, for example, if you get a prize for, for finding a, a bug in the, in the, in, in the comp, if you find a mistake in the computation, but you know that you don't have any reason to believe that mistakes will actually occur, then why are you wasting your time ver you know, doing the verification at all? TrueBit is in two parts. The first one is, is this verification game that we uh, just discussed. And the second one is an, an incentive layer to convince people that they should participate in, in verification. The idea there is that we sort of force the system to occasionally create mistakes so that uh, verifiers are actually going to look out for them and, and um, you know, they have a, an incentive to participate that way. So you have a, uh, we call this a forced error mechanism. So occasionally TrueBit will create these forced errors and then the, the, the verifiers should, should find those and that should keep them um, uh, available and interested in playing the game and it also serves as a sort of um, a proof that the verifiers are actually verifying because otherwise, how does the system know that, that anyone's checking the answer? That's the problem. I think we, we need to uh, go into the basic concept, basic concept a little bit, right? Like, so, so imagine, imagine like this, like this, like this simple scenario. Um, there's Sebastian, right? And Sebastian wants, wants to run a smart contract that is going to consume 50 million gas units, right? Doesn't, it doesn't matter what Sebastian wants to do. It is, it, is, it is something that is complex enough. Like he wants to run a very complicated gambling lottery, right? It has a, it has a lot of rules. And in order to um, do some steps inside his gambling application, uh, he needs 50 million gas today. So today, if you look at the Ethereum system, the gas limit is what, like 5 million or something, right? Which means Sebastian's transaction will never fit into an Ethereum block as it stands today, right? Now, what you're saying is like TrueBit is a solution that Sebastian could use to, ha to have a smart contract com computation that can, that can run in enough steps to consume 50 million gas, right? Now, how would it work? How would how would Sebastian get his computation or transaction that consumes 50 million gas into uh, into the blockchain? Like, what do what does he need to do, and who are the players that allow Sebastian to do this? Truebit itself is a smart contract in Ethereum. That's 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 what it is. It's, it takes that. That form, so it's it's. I guess you can think of it as a, a smart contract that can be called by other smart contracts that need additional gas. And then this uh, Truebit smart contract, if you will, will will recruit the other parties needed and incentivize them properly to to make sure that the output of that contract is the correct answer to the query that came in. I mean, the main parties you have there is that you have a a task giver who's the one who, who sends in the task that needs to be performed. You have a, a solver who's going to um, provide a, an alleged solution. And then you have a verifier who's going to make sure that that alleged solution is actually correct. And then you also have these, these, uh, the miners who function as judges and referees to make sure that, just to make sure that they play by the rules of the game without actually doing the computation themselves. And those are the players. So, so normally when like a computation happens on Ethereum, computation is triggered by a transaction. So for example, I, I create a transaction and that transaction like triggers a computation and then there's an, uh, then, then, then there's an output to that computation. And I broadcast this transaction to the miners and the miner that includes my transaction in the next block has to make the computation and all of the other nodes have to verify that computation, right? Now, 
in this case what we are doing is when i create a transaction that like triggers a very large computation the blockchain sort of outsources that computation to an individual solver am i am, am i reading that right that instead of all of the nodes of the ethereum network needing to do that computation they're going to outsource that computation to a particular solver which is like an individual machine and in order to ensure that that the output of that individual machine is correct there are going to be other verifiers that are going to verify that that output is correct and this game between solvers and verifiers is going to ensure me the user that the output given by the system is correct so this is not something which needs to be implemented as part of yeah ethereum itself so nothing in ethereum itself changes and so that's why I wouldn't use the term transaction. Uh, it's just, so Trubit will just be a smart contract which people can use by calling its functions. I mean, in the end, of course, you send transactions to that smart contract, but uh, it doesn't automatically, so as part of Ethereum, we don't automatically outsource uh, this, this computational tasks. And the, the, the forms of these computational tasks are also different than uh, what you currently have on Ethereum. So you, uh, you don't, have the Ethereum virtual machine, for example. We plan to use a similar thing, but uh, a different virtual machine. And it's also important that, um, I mean, that's kind of an implementation detail, but uh, the tasks that are to be performed have to be yeah, kind of pure functions. So you don't directly have access to the blockchain or uh, yeah, things that are available in Solidity, like, like msg.sender and all this stuff. Um, you can make that available via uh, yeah, Merkle proofs to the blockchain, which are easy to verify in, the, uh, in, in such a true bit uh, computation because you have a lot more uh, yeah, gas, in quotes, uh, available. So I'd, I'd also like to add that, you know, clear, clear up the, the roles that are being played here, that anyone can participate in the network, anyone can choose to be a solver. The way that the protocol is, 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 is we designed it is that you know the, it essentially you, there's a, a lottery that 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 chooses who gets to be a solver, but anyone can all, always um, verify. And of course, the more the merrier. The more you know, we only need one verifier, but if you have more, it, it doesn't hurt. So, but these these solvers and verifiers live live off chain, and really the 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 only thing that sits on the blockchain itself is the the enforcement of these rules of the game. Let's take a short break to talk about Jax. Jax is your wallet, your complete user interface to cover all your blockchain needs. I've been using it and I've been loving it. Now, Jax supports a lot of different cryptocurrencies. It supports Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, Zcash, Augur Rep, and they're adding many more. Keep responding to users' needs. Now, with Jax, the nice thing is that you can manage all of those coins within a single wallet and you are in control of your own private keys. They're not on their server. And there's a single 12 word seed that you can use to back up your wallet, all your coins and sync them across different devices. Talking about devices, they're on pretty much any device that you can think of. You can get it on PC, Mac, Linux. You can get it on smartphones like Android and Apple and iPhone. You can get it on tablets or even, there are even browser extensions for Chrome and Firefox. And on top of that, in JAX, you can actually exchange different cryptocurrencies for each other because they've integrated a shapeshift. And more partnerships and integrations are coming down the line in 2017 that are going to make JAX even better. So JAX is really making blockchain and cryptocurrencies accessible for the masses, easy to use for the masses. Make sure, sure to get your own JAX wallet at JAX.io or you can get it from any of the app stores you are using. We'd like to thank Jax for their support of Epicenter. Let's de define then what is a, so there's different participants, right? There's a task giver, the solver, the verifier. I think there's a, a challenger too, or is Let's that... define each of them. Like who is a task giver, who is a challenger, who is a solver, who is a verifier, and what do they do? So you have the task giver, which basically specifies the, the function to compute, the program to execute and the input. So the task um, giver is the one who sends the smart contract to the to the blockchain. Can, yeah, I wouldn't call it a smart contract. It's just a, a program to execute. Okay. It can be a smart contract, but it's just a program to execute. And the task giver also 
provides a pays for the task giver also pays for the whole thing, right? So you you pay a fee, and uh, then a server actually performs the uh, the execution, runs the the program, and then posts the result onto the blockchain, just the result, and then verifiers can basically do the same thing as the solver, just rerun the whole program and check whether they come up with the same result. Um, nobody's forced to do that. So, and, and verifiers can also come in from outside at any time and just uh, rerun uh, these programs. And okay. if they come with a different, if they come up with a, with a different result, then they can challenge the result. And that's I see. So the verifier, the point where then the verifier turns challenger. into the challenger. That's a bit clearer then. then uh, once the solver has produced the results, uh, and you want you want to have verification. So you know, you, as the task giver, I want um, more than one verification uh, attesting that this is in fact the right result. Uh, so I may have one, one verifier that produces a, a verification, uh, another that produces a verification, and maybe I have like five or six. And at which point, as a task giver, can I be sure that or have enough certainty that my computation, the results of my computation as provided by the solver is accurate? And is there, a, is there an incentive model there that starts to drop off? Because I, I suppose in the, verif the solver and the verifiers get paid for all of this. Uh, you know, if I'm the thousandth verifier, does it even does it even make sense for me to participate in this verification? So there's there's some this whole thing has has an interesting property. So the the, the verification game uh, is always uh, yeah will always find out who is right and who is wrong. Okay, and this is all this is all deposit based as in in other. So if if the sol if if the solver posts a an incorrect task, the solver will be punished. Ah. So this whole system should already work, um, even with just a single solver, without any verifier. But you just so that the, as long as the task giver knows that the solver thinks that someone is verifying, so there doesn't have to be an actual verifier out there. But we designed the system in a way that uh, it's extremely likely that there is a verifier out there, and the solver knows that. So the verifier, okay, I see that. So, so the solver is providing a response uh, and is incentivized, because he's putting a deposit, he's incentivized to provide the right, the right result because a verifier may verify it uh, and prove him wrong and then therefore get the deposit. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. How, is, is there like a time period? Because you know, perhaps I, as a solver, I provided a, you know, a bad response or a bad result and then you know, I get, my deposit, I get, you know, the, the deposit. And then three weeks later, someone discovers that I was actually wrong. How, how, how does that play out? So, yeah, I mean, there, there are, there are timeouts. So this, this whole okay. thing consists of multiple rounds and there are timeouts in each round. And sure. So if, if the system fails in the way that the solver can post an incorrect answer and nobody challenges this, then it will not be detected. So at so, I mean, at some point you have to, Basically, finalize the result. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, you you could build a different system where you can challenge again even after a long time, but that's probably not going to work out. It's starting to become clearer now. I see. So uh, coming back to my my original question, what types of computations are likely to be run on this? Like when you say I want to run this computation, and it's it's not a smart contract. It's 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 code going through this smart contract that handles you know this deposit and the, you know the verification and the solving and all that providing the proofs um can i can i throw at it like c plus plus code or whatever like uh in go or is it, does it have to be in solidity uh, how is it packaged like how does how does one send that payload onto the blockchain yes we want this to be usable as nicely as possible so we want uh regular programs to be run there which means yeah, programs written in C++ or uh, Go or Python. And because of that, we chose... Okay, that, that's, that's the goal. And the, the requirement is that we need some kind of uh, architecture 
uh, that can be easy, easily implemented on the Ethereum virtual machine because the, the, the blockchain, the TrueBit smart contract, needs to verify this single step. And in the end, you have to implement, so it, it's a single step on, a, on, on some machine, and in the end, you have to implement the full logic of, of such a machine. And uh, it turns out that there is a, an architecture called Lanai, and uh, this is something developed by Google, and I think nobody really knows what they actually use it for, but um, <laughs> what they did is they built an, a backend for the LLVM uh, compiler, so it is possible to take C++ code and Rust code and whatever LLVM can, can take as input and compile it into the Lanai architecture. And from that on, the TrueBit uh, contract can verify. So this means that, uh, yeah, uh, you will be able to verify any programs at least written in C++ uh, and Rust. And you can also uh, go a step higher because we don't really have a, a gas limit and uh, uh, run programs which are written in a programming language that has an interpreter written in C++, for example. And Python is one of these. So I, I have a, one last question before we go to the next topic, which is, you know, what, what applications do we, can we, can we use this for? Uh, and, and that is, the, uh, I guess, the determinist, non-deterministic nature, perhaps, of some of these languages. Um, it, you know, I, perhaps I'll, okay, so I have some understanding of computer science, but I'm not a computer scientist, uh, but you know, maybe this doesn't make sense, but I'll throw it at you anyways. Um, I, as a task giver, you know, send some C++ code to be solved by um, a solver. Um, it, it's my understanding that, you know, maybe on my environment, if I run this, I'll get one result and another environment uh, may get some other result. And the form of verification languages somewhat address this issue or perhaps address this issue fully. So for these languages that are not, that we not, cannot formally verify, is there a risk that a solver may, in good faith, provide a result that was valid on his system, uh, but maybe not valid on mine, or maybe like a, a verifier checks it and it, it doesn't check out? Does that question even make sense? Or does... yeah, I mean, that, that's what the, the Lanai, the not, that's what Lanai is for. It's to make it all uh, standardized so that you, the Lanai interpreter will have, will exist also on the blockchain, the, the full code. So you. Okay. So have... standardization was where I was, I guess, trying to address here. Is, critical. You know, we... Absolutely yeah. critical. I think we will we'll ramp that up in stages where we, we, we first start with only specific tasks and then we allow uh, arbitrary tasks when we see that, that everything works out. And um, so the thing is that you, when, you when, when the solver executes the task, then the solver will probably not run the, the Lanai interpreter, so go all the way down in the stack to the, to the final architecture because of performance reasons. So uh, the idea will be that you take the C++ code and compile it to your native machine, run it there, and then you get a result. And, uh, of course, it might be that this result is different if you compile it all the way down to, to Lanai. And uh, so in this situation, uh, we might have a fallback where um, we don't have to play the... So, and the verification game uh, will be played on the Lanai level. And so the, the solver, when we start the verification game, then the solver would notice, oh yeah, I get a different result. Uh, sorry, my bad, or something like that. But yeah, so the, the tasks that... I mean, in the end, it's, it's, it's a consensus computer again, right? So the tasks that are given should be uh, deterministic and uh, should be, yeah, mathematical functions, so to say, which always really yield the same result. I, I'd like to add what, to what Christian just mentioned about, you know, the, the, the mistake on, on, you know, to say we, we, we have to fully trust that the Lanai interpreter is going to um, interpret the programs correctly. And, you know, it's, this, this could be an iterative process. You know, it's obviously Lanai is a new program as well, but the good news is the entire Lanai interpreter is sitting on the blockchain, so it's fully transparent. We can issue, you know, a new contract. Everyone can inspect the code. It's not like sending it into, you know, a, a cloud computer on, on Amazon where you don't see the hardware, you don't see the software. You, I mean, they may tell you what it is, but you can't, you can't 
you know, witness it in the same way that you, you would be able to do in, in, on, a, on a true bit computation. Okay, so, uh, so, so we, have, we have walked through the idea of there being like solvers, verifiers, and the combination of solver, verifier, and challenger ensuring that uh, the result of a particular computation in true bit is, is, is correct, right? So now, like assuming we have this system, we have Ethereum, which is the sort of base layer, and then we have this other layer, true bit on top, which allows us to scale computations on, like scale ownerless computations in a way, right? Like in, in Ethereum, you have computations that are not owned by anybody, and they are guaranteed to be correct. And we are able to kind of scale uh, these sorts of computations using true bit. So like once that happens, what are the sorts of applications that, that open up? Well, I, I, I guess we could say there, there, are, there are many. Uh, you know, we've also had several people suggest applications to us. You know, as, as Vitalik used to say, the best application for Ethereum is the one that I haven't thought of yet. And I think the same could be said true for, for TrueBit as well. You know, this is really, we're talking about a, a community project. The abstract machine itself is not an, is not a, an end, but a, a means. So, so um, let's start with the obvious application, outsourced computation. Um, so TrueBit, I, I guess we should clarify when we say outsourced computation, we're not computing with the, we're not competing with the Amazon cloud um, in, in the sense that it's expensive to run a, a TrueBit computation. And the, the security of the, of the system may degrade as, you know, for truly extremely large computations. Um, of course, in the long run, we hope to optimize it for, you know, we, 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 we believe that there are optimizations possible that, that can, you know, push it further. But we're, you know, the first goal is to get beyond the trivial computation of what can be done in smart contracts now and then push it further. So um, there are several other projects. As, as, as Christian mentioned earlier, the, the Doge Ethereum bridge is, was an early inspiration for this project. I mean, the, it, what the Doge Ethereum bridge would allow is, is, is um, Sheebs, uh, the, the Dogecoin users, to take their Doge and basically send them off the Dogecoin blockchain onto the Ethereum blockchain. TrueBit would check the Dogecoin script proof of work to, to confirm the, the transfer. So that's the reason we need TrueBit. And then there would just be you know, some sort of token on the Ethereum network that represents a Dogecoin um, token. You could use that to, um, you know, in, a, in a smart contract. And then sometime when you're ready, you just send the, the, that token back to Dogecoin and it's, it's, a, it's a Doge again. So. so then Ethereum is sort of a side chain to the Dogecoin chain? Is it, so you send the Doge to an address, that it, you know, there's a computation that verifies that the, the coins are there and then they get issued as a token on, eth on Ethereum? Right, so once you send it over to Ethereum, it's sort of Dogecoin des destroys the coin. And when, it, when you send it back from Ethereum, it annihilates the token. So, so it's, 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 that's how the process would, would work on the, the high level. But you can, imagine that you, can, you can imagine that if Dogecoin, for example, if Dogecoin wasn't the only one that wanted to send uh, coins to, to Ethereum, you know, you could have other blockchains also doing this, you know, sending their coins and turning them into tokens on Ethereum, and then you could exchange them. You know, you wouldn't need, you don't need a, a third party exchange to, 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 to switch those tokens. So what's, what's needed in order to, to so, so I think in order to export your tokens to, to, the, to this conglomerate system, if you will, in order to export, you just need to make some opcode in your system that says export, uh, across the bridge, um, the token, the, the, the coin. And if you want to be a hub that imports them, you need to have some sort of smart contract functionality that can, you know, as, as Ethereum does, verify the proof of work for that other, other chain. So, so anyone can be a hub and anyone can be uh, a, a participant. So obviously a, being a hub is slightly more involved because doing smart contracts is a big deal. But um, that's how it sounds very similar to another project that is about to do a crowd sale for which a host of ours perhaps works there. <laughs> it sounds very similar to Cosmos. I mean, what you're describing, basically. Except for the different, very different architecture. So, um, right, so like, the architecture is different, but the, 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 the functionality and the use that you get out of it is, is, is essentially the same. 
basically coins that effortlessly move across blockchains. So you could have like like hundreds of chains and the coins of one chain could could go to another, do something there and then come back like that, right? So this is like, this would make all blockchains sort of interoperable. I don't know if that's the correct word for it. I think that's fair. I mean, one, you know, one difference with Cosmos is they, you, you sort of, as my understanding from watching your video is that in order to participate in Cosmos, you sort of have to delegate responsibility to a set of validators who are going to execute these, these um, exchanges for you. And, you know, it, in TrueBit, there are no, you know, upper class nodes, you know, there's, it's, there's no hierarchy. It's, it's, it's purely democratic. We're, we are organic grassroots organization. Anyone who wants to build a bridge can build a bridge and anyone who doesn't want anything to do with the bridge can do their own thing. And, and you, don't, you don't have to sort of decide whether or not to, to delegate your authority to this, you know, giant conglomerate that's, that's already out there. It's, it's just an agreement between two people, which is, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's, that's the idea. I don't, not two people, two communities. Let's say it like that. <laughs> you got it. Okay. So I think I think that's that's a very that's a very big application, right? So you're saying that okay, so the one blockchain can verify uh, what has happened on another chain using um, by delegating this task of sort of verification to to Truebit, right? And uh, what are what are some other applications for uh, for your system? So. Another one is, is I, I think, you know, a storage solution. As you can grab information from other blockchains, you can also grab from, say, Swarm, which if you have a, a place where you can permanently store information, so just in general, whether it's on a blockchain, whether it's on Swarm, you know, Truebit can sort of use that. Solvers and verifiers can access that information in their computations. You know, maybe, you know, import a, a Merkle root of, of whatever the data is that you want to use in the Truebit computation and, and it's accessible. Could one think of building, uh, so we've had uh, Marley Gray from, uh, from Microsoft who, who told us about Bletchley and Cripplets and you know, what, what Microsoft is doing now, not to get into too much detail about that, well, you know, they're using uh, Intel SGX or the, the idea is to use Intel SGX uh, uh, hardware, which allows the proof computations to do to do this, right? So you can delegate uh, a computation to a, 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 a trusted execution environment to do some form of computation or um, to retrieve data from um, a, a, a feed. So you could have some sort of an Oracle that is retrieving data from, I don't know, like Bloomberg. And with TLS Notary, you've got the the, your, the certainty that that data feed is in fact coming from Bloomberg. And then that cripplet, which is, you know, a, a trust execution environment is feeding that into a smart contract. Um, is this something that would be possible with, uh, with Truebit to, to build this sort of Oracle that is verifying a, a, a feed and, and providing it to a smart contract as an Oracle? Yeah, so I think that that doesn't really fit the Truebit model. So the, the, one of the, the essential requirements for the verification game to work is that a Truebit smart contract needs to ensure that uh, all solvers and all verifiers have access to all data that is involved. And this can be done on Swarm because on Swarm, at least in the in the final version, we will have uh, yeah this 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 these storage uh, certificates. And because of that, uh, you can use Swarm as a yeah. So Truebit basically creates the. <laughs> The, uh, the driver, the file system driver to add Swarm as a file system to, to Ethereum. But um, it doesn't solve the Oracle problem because you have... Okay. Yeah. So because it's not deterministic. Yeah, it's not, not yeah, a function uh, that maps inputs to outputs. Yeah, exactly. We also read uh, there were some proposals to use Truebit to build decentralized mining pools for Ethereum itself. So uh, you're use Ethereum to build true, Truebit and then Truebit would be used to build a decentralized mining pool for Ethereum. Like, tell us, tell us how something like that would work. Smart Pool is, is a project that I was uh, involved in from the very beginning. You know, I was, I am a co-author of the Truebit white paper along with um, 
well, the people who are actually building SmartPool, Loy Lu, Yaron Bellner, and, and also Pratik Saxena was a, a, a co-author on the white paper. Uh, basically, SmartPool is a, is, a, a, it's, it's, it's a mining pool where the, the operator for the pool is an Ethereum smart contract. Now, that can be a pool for a Bitcoin. It could be a pool for Ethereum. Of course, it's very cool if it's a pool for Ethereum because the smart contract is, 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 is on Ethereum. Um, and, you know, originally I thought they would, I, I was sure they were going to need TrueBit to, to, to build out the, the Ethereum version of, of uh, because of the way the, of SmartPool, because of the way that the, you know, it, it, it's hard to check an Ethereum proof of work. It requires a lot of storage, uh, as opposed to Bitcoin, where you, you could sort of do it right away. But uh, due to some, you know, I guess, I guess I would call it a fluke in the, a coincidence in the in the in the construction of the Ethereum proof of work, SmartPool found a clever way to do it without that they. I, I don't think they're going to need TrueBit, but TrueBit may be useful for for other other uh, checking other proof of works. For example, Dogecoin or Zcash, which are you know maybe just out of reach of what uh, smart contracts can do. So I mean the smart the SmartPool application is is interesting because you know if you have a, a pool. Uh, operator who's managing the contract. You don't, there's no censorship. You can write it at a low cost. There's no social contract. You know, you, you're normally, you know, you know there's, there's a sort of social contract between members of the pool and the miner that, that they get paid and, and so on. Um, the, the smart contract sort of enforces that. You know, you also have, there are other sort of decentralized pools out there like P2 pool, but they have higher variance, which sort of negates the purpose of joining a pool in the first place, the payout variance. And of course, it's retrofitting. You don't need to make any changes to the uh, blockchain itself. So, so I mean, smart pool is is sort of uh, an interesting potential application of for TrueBit. I would say that. Cool. Uh, so, before we wrap up, uh, tell us where, what's the pro what's the state of the project right now, and what's the roadmap? Where do you plan to take this? Is there like a, a release or you know, uh, some sort of a, are you planning to build a company out of this? Or, so tell us what you're, where you're taking this. Well, actually, before I answer that, I, I wanted to mention sort of, if, if, if I may, one other, one other application, which may be very interesting. I, I know we talked about sure. sort of that, that TrueBit is a connection between the blockchains along the lines of Cosmos. But I think we want to be not only the connection between, you know, the, the blockchain of blockchains, but, you know, as you say, but the glue between blockchains, but also the glue between blockchains and the real world. So as an example of this, there's a, there's a one project that's very interesting by uh, Doug Pitcanix and Eric Tang called LivePeer, which is live um, decentralized streaming video. So they're, they're, they're basically going to use TrueBit to do the broadcast encoding. So I guess you could imagine YouTube without the YouTube. As you know, it's expensive to, 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 to do live broadcasts of, you know, sporting events and things like that. So it, that's, that's something I think that where we see this technology can bridge the gap between, you know, uh, cryptocurrency enthusiasts and, and uh, you know, really bring, bring the technology home to, to your everyday people who can use it. So. I mean, this is also similar to with, with LivePeer, basically you, you, you outsource the actual compression of, of the stream. And uh, yeah, and, I don't know, Golem and, and these other projects do a similar thing for, for other tasks, for other computational tasks. And for all of these, TrueBit can be the mechanism that ensures that uh, the, the computation nodes just don't do anything but do the actual tasks that are, they, they are supposed to do. All right, so then uh, let, let's, let's uh, come back to the previous question. Uh, what, uh, what is the state of the project and where do you plan to take it? So we are in the process of, you know, turning this white paper into a reality. You know, we, are, we want to make it uh, available to, to everyone. It's uh, partly built out, but we're not ready to release it to the public yet. So it's, it's, it's a fairly uh, ambitious and experimental system. And of course, it will require a fair bit of testing too, because some, uh, some of the um, Parameters and so forth are depend on um, human behavior and things like this, which 
you know, our, we, we want to test our assumptions of, of, of rationality, but you know, as you say, it's not, this isn't a type of project where you can, you can't prove it by mathematics. The, the proof is, is when it actually works in the real world. So, so that's, that's the next step is to, to get it out. And you know, we're, we're right now in the process of connecting with, with people who, who want to use this technology and we encourage, you know, people with good ideas to get in touch with us and, and let us know how you want to use TrueBit and, um, you know, possibly what, what, what features you'd, you'd like to see in the, in the, in the next version of the programs. And if anybody wants to help, you know, participate in any way and get involved, how can they do that? We're, right, so we're right now we're, we are actively looking for funding for the project and we're looking for people who can help us develop. So if you uh, want to do either of those things, we're, we're um, you know, please get in touch with us. Will you do an ICO of, of any kind to raise funding here? Uh, ICO is, is a possibility for us. Uh, we, you know, we don't have an immediate plan for an ICO. So in theory, like how how would an ICO ICO model model work? So I understand the, the the funding part of it. So there'll be tokens, people will buy them, they become stakeholders. But once the system goes live and people start delegating these computations, uh, uh, how how do the token holders get compensated, or how how do they earn a, a profit on their investment once the system is live? Well, first of all, we don't consider this an investment because it's uh, it would be a product. As a product, you know, if you're if you wanted to, for example, get I mean, one again, we don't we don't have a, a specific st structure in mind, but you know, solvers could get paid for for um, performing tasks, and task givers could pay for for having you know tasks they want to have performed. So anyone can participate, um, you know, and regardless of what currency is used to, to do the actual transactions. That's how the system would work. It's, it's, a, it's an outsourced computation model. You pay for computation time. And anyone who wants to offer CPU cycles can, can get paid for doing so. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a pleasure talking to you guys and learning more about TrueBit. I, I, I have to say, I, I, I have a much better understanding of it now. It makes a lot more sense and the use cases also are, are a lot more clear. So we'll be looking forward to seeing where this project, uh, how this project evolves and, and uh, wish you a lot of success. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having us. So thanks again for coming on and thank you for to our listeners for tuning in. We are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network, soon to be the Let's Talk Network, but still the Let's Talk Bitcoin Network. Uh, and so you can go to letstalkbitcoin.com to find this show and a lot of other great shows. Uh, you can also support us by leaving us an iTunes review that helps others find the show. And uh, also if you're interested, you, you, know, you can give us a tip. Uh, our tipping address in Bitcoin and Ether, and Ether are both in the show description. And uh, so yeah, we'll be looking forward to being back next week. Thank you.